Learning 101. Today we're critiquing or reviewing a variety of different curriculum options just so that you can kind of get an idea for what's out there, things we've used and loved. Uh, there's no way to cover every possible thing, but these are some of our favorites. Today we're going to start with math. And as you're probably aware, um, there's a big sort of schism between people who are doing um, sort of traditional math and new math. So another way to kind of look at it is math that's skill-based versus math that is really working on mathematical reasoning or uh, mathematical problem solving. And so in the homeschool community, there's a little bit of a divide about um, how much of the new math you need. And this is a decision you'll have to make on, on your own, but we'll try to sort of tie that into our curriculum choices. So Renee, Go ahead, since you, I think yours, you have a, a very uh, linear model, tell us your experience with math. Thanks, Helen. Um, what I've used for all of my children uh, from kindergarten up through high school is Saxon Math. And uh, we really like this program. It's very straightforward. Um, it starts out with warm ups, and then it goes through review of previous lessons. It introduces the new concept, and then there's a lesson with uh, skills on how to do the new concept, uh, worksheets, and then it goes back and it, it does mixed skill review with old and new concepts. Uh, the program comes with the uh, student book, it has the worksheets, it has the tests, it has the answer keys. Um, it's very uh, user-friendly for, for a homeschool mom or dad to, to be teaching to their children. And it's worked very well for us. And we've really enjoyed that program. So all my kids did Nikon math. And basically this is done with Cuisineer rods and everything about it is super hands-on. And the thing I like about it is it's been around for 40 years. It's very well researched, but it's still that component of hands-on and also asking kids to think. Um, I, did that all the way through and I supplemented with Montessori math. So I bought a lot of Montessori pieces that we really just hit that hard. We did so many math units and math in that way. So once we got to the next part and I felt like we really needed a textbook, I switched my first children to Math C. At that time, it was really sort of a revolutionary idea and it was taking, the, you know, they don't use Cuisinier rods, but it's a similar idea. And so, that my two oldest children went all the way through uh, Algebra 1 with that. And I was, the thing that I still love about that is it's very easy to teach. It was, uh, you know, very, um, you know, just everything flowed. It came with, at the time, these videotapes that you could use for supplemental things. So once you had taught it, if you wanted to actually show the videotape and then it still has um, him there actually explaining each thing. So I was very happy with it and my children scored very high on their testing. So that seemed like it was all a win until it was time I felt like um, for what I thought was going to be the step after Algebra 1, I hired a very beloved local math teacher to come to my house. And he said, you know, your kids have all their math facts down. It's amazing. You know, those math time tests you did were, were wonderful. But um, they really are lacking some mathematical reasoning that a different kind of curriculum probably would have taught them. And I was just like, ah! You hear, this is what I thought I was trying to do all along. Interestingly, though, the same thing happened at the time to two of my other friends who had used math, you see, and they didn't mind. One of them was having their child go into um, high school, and that was a relatively smooth uh, fit. The other one um, just wasn't worried about that and kept going through math. So it's not everybody's story, but it's definitely mine. So my, um, I then did a big switch and never did math. <laughs> Again, but that doesn't mean that it's not really great for a lot of situations. Again, it's pretty fun, it's very easy to teach. My second two children, I did not have them go all the way through Matthew C. They found that it was not moving quickly enough for them. They kind of got a little bit, um, they're just, that was just not a good fit for them. And so they started Singapore math when they were pretty young. And I'm thinking I switched them to that probably first or second grade. And my other kids all did um, Singapore math. You know, Singapore math is, uh, 
now widely available. You can get it everywhere. When I first started, it was much harder to get it, but we knew people from Singapore, and of course, you know, Singapore is always at the top for the world as for score, kids scoring in math and science. I thought, oh, they must be doing something right. Um, I loved math teaching math for Singapore science. Not everybody does. You do have to teach yourself a little bit about it. It's not something like Saxon or math you see that you can just sit down, you know, spend 10 minutes and it's obvious to you. you. You have to spend a little time reading through what's going on there, as you would probably with any new math. But I think it's not impossible. I don't, I don't even think it's that hard, but it does take a little more time to think through how it's going to be put together. So some people don't like that about it. The other problem with the Singapore science is that while you know, while your child is doing it, I, I just really loved how it was put together. Some people don't realize that there's a textbook and there's a workbook. And so um, when you ordered it, it's a little bit confusing for sometimes for some people to figure out, you know, what's one semester, what's one year, what grade are your ch children in. But the other thing that happens is that once your child gets to high school, it's pretty hard to keep going with Singapore math if you are not teaching it. So when my children got to say Algebra 2, they ended up switching into other programs. And so if you're looking for something thinking like, oh, I want the same math all the way along, that, that could be a problem. In the end, I was perfectly happy with it because I thought, you know, I got where we wanted to be. And then when it was time for them to each go into um, a different kind of math, usually Saxon if you're in a homeschool group, you know, it was very easy for them to switch into a different thing. And I felt like that mathematical, mathematical reasoning was then already in place. I also supplemented with um, books from Critical Thinking um, Company that has some just, just really high quality pro, um, products to kind of, you know, even move farther into that mathematical reasoning. Um, I just want to say one other thing. I think there's well, there's lots of math curriculums that work, you know, well, people seem really happy. It is probably important to not just think about the math tests that your child takes at the end, those uh, skill-based, um, you know, comprehension tests, at the, you know, competency tests. If what you're wanting to have in the end is kids that are going to go off and do science or math or computer science at college, the other thing is, uh, this is like a little tip, is Renee and I have found over the years that every once in a while something comes along that's all online and people are so happy with it. People are thinking like, oh my gosh, I don't have to do anything. It's just online and, uh, you know, I don't even look at it. My child does it on their own. My child loves it. And sooner or later we'll hear almost always we'll hear back from those people two years later. Oh no, we lost a year and a half of math. So even if you're picking an online curriculum for math, oh, it's really important to see some of your child's work because it's so easy on that computer to just keep pushing the button, right? Or to look at the answer and go back. It just turns out to be a really different thing. So if you are picking an online curriculum, whatever it's promising you about math, I would really try to figure out how you can have something in place where some of your child's actual math work is getting correct, corrected by a live person and it's being gone over with your child, whether that's a tutor on a Zoom or a family member. Uh, it just, I just have rarely seen it work that you put a child completely online for math and two years later people are like, oh yeah, that worked out really well. They'll, they'll think it worked out well a semester or a year later, but down the line it just seems to have Oh, some very negative consequences. What what are you what are your experiences, Renee? I really agree with that point about uh, having a, a live person grade the work, give the feedback, go over the tests. Um, it's really important, and you'll find it's particularly as you go through high school, having feedback from that teacher. It's it's one thing to you only missed three problems, but if you don't know why you missed them, if you haven't been able to go back and, and understand that and have someone give you some input into where you went wrong with those problems, um, it's really hard to move forward because you'll keep making those same mistakes over and over again. Thanks, Renee. So just to kind of 
sum up this long thing that I'm going that I've gone through is that one thing that does happen in homeschooling is that there's a number of curriculums that go a little bit light on science and math in my opinion and if that's you know if that's something that you don't mind and you're on board with that then it, this isn't a concern but if you are looking ahead at those type of careers or it's just something you really value you might want to find yourself adding on to your math curriculum. So I probably overdid it. I'm not even sure if there is a math man manipulative that I didn't buy. I mean, it was just every possible thing we were buying it, we were doing it all the time. So, but I really wanted to make sure that that piece was in there. So when you're looking at your math curriculum, you might want to look at how it's been researched and how long it's been around and what the outcomes are. Not just, okay, there's five people that went to med school or something that took it, but um, do, is, there, you know, is there a bulk of history with that curriculum and with those outcomes? Because there's going to be a number of things that people pick because they're easy to do, they're you know, engaging, they're enjoyable. And a thing to think about is if you do have a child that just really does not like math or just hates math, then it's better to find something that they want to do and they're happy with. Of course, there's that for sure. But there's a, there's a really wide range in homeschooling of the curriculums that are available and where you're going to be by high school. So it's kind of a thing that you, you have to take some time and think through uh, your, yourself, like, you know, what is it worth to make that this is easy, that this is fun, and where do I, where do I want to be? But also, if you possibly have some money in your homeschool budget to make sure that you do have at least some manipulatives at home, I would really advise it. I, I do think I went way, way too heavy on that, but um, I think a, a little of that goes a long way. That said, there's certainly a lot of homeschoolers that you know, don't use many manipulatives and it all turns out fine. But this is just my bias to have a, a lot of manipulatives. There's just nothing like you're teaching a lesson and you're acting it out, you're working through the manipulatives to make it seem engaging. I, I think it's kind of like if you taught science and you never had um, any experiments. I, I look at it like that. So I always try to teach a math lesson with manipulatives every day to sort of cement ideas, make things clear. I think that one thing that happens with science and homeschooling, in my opinion, is that a lot of curriculums don't give you enough science, but maybe I just wanted to offer, you know, much more science than, than most people did. So I used, um, two science programs, basically. So um, I use Singapore Science, which is very accessible and worked in really well with unit studies. And I also use sunlight curriculum. So I did this, you know, all the way through until my children started to take outside science classes. And I found that sunlight had the advantage of, you know, it comes with a box. It has all the things that you need for the experiments. I really enjoyed the books that come with it, so that from a very early age, um, you know, it just really lent itself to unit studies. But for me, it wasn't enough. So then I would still go to the library with those suitcases I talk about with for my kids, and we would get more books to read on whatever the topic was. But I really enjoy teaching uh, science as a unit study and interlocking unit studies. And so it worked just fine for me to do that also in combination with Singapore science. And so that's also laid out in a way that it's a little bit of, um, it, it's definitely topic based. So, you know, you'll have it. It, 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 it's going to go into depth about certain topics one after the other. So I use those two together and then I sometimes also picked other units. The thing about Singapore that I very much um, enjoy is the way it's set up. The textbook is very colorful. It really is good at having the main specific points clear so that you can be sure that your child is kind of checking off those boxes. The thing that people don't like about Singapore Science is that there isn't a box of um, items, so you're going to have to sort of find things on your own. And since it's, you know, it is used very widely by homeschoolers, but 
it's designed to be taught in school, there's definitely things in there that you have to kind of look a little bit ahead of time to find. So you might one year have to get a Bunsen burner, but these are things you're probably going to use later. It's just that and the, you know, the summer before or whenever, you kind of have to look through and see, okay, I'm gonna have to find this, I'm gonna have to find that. And, and some people really just like that. I, I didn't think it was burdensome, and if there was something that I just thought, oh, I can't get that together, you can always just skip that one particular experiment or show a video about it or get a, a video about it. The other thing that we did with science that was very useful is we used our local nature center both here and in um, and much more so even in Michigan. And the thing is, is if you get the schedule ahead of time of what's being offered, it's very <laughs> slick to sort of tie that in with those units. So if you know uh, you're going to use sunlight, you know you're going to use um, Singapore, and then you take advantage of the fact that, you know, whatever you have nearby, whatever science uh, museum or nature center you have, that you have sort of built-in field trips or built-in lectures coming, you can just change the order. And so I did all of those things and put them together, but I was very happy with how those two things work together. So by the time that my children were in, um, high school, we were taking outside science classes. And I feel that it is the rare homeschool parent who is equipped to teach science through high school. So it's not that I didn't keep doing some unit studies or do field trips or uh, do a variety of things at home about science, but to have the actual instruction and the labs done somewhere so where, where that was, you know, someone was spending a lot of time on that. So it's true that you could teach physics at home, but it would probably be a lot different than if your child took it as an outside class. So it's, if you're new to homeschooling, you may find yourself thinking that, oh, you know, uh, here's this curriculum, I'm going to go through it. But just realize that there's, it's really the rare person who can pull off the, those higher level science classes especially once you get done with biology. So the, the thing that is sort of the, that you have to weigh then is, is how is that gonna happen? So one thing that works very well is if, you know, I was very fortunate with consortium that my children could take classes there. Another thing that works very well is to get together with a group of families that have children your own age and uh, hire someone to come and, and, and teach a particular topic. You know, it works, it, it, it can have a different person. So for example, um, my son was doing Science Olympiad and we wanted to give him more advanced kind of chemistry. So we found a, a wonderful young man who had graduated from Cornell and um, specifically in chemistry to, to teach him that and another person for physics. So it's possible to, to do that too, where you, you have someone, um, you know, working with a small group or with just your child. There's also a number of programs that are online where even though that's probably not as good as being there in person, um, that you can pull that piece. And another thing that's often done in high school is to send a child to community college or college early. I did this with my older children and there's advantages. The labs are, are very good. Um, the, the, sort of expectations, maybe a little bit higher. However, um, I, like a lot of people, found that it's just not as rewarding as an experience for your child when they are that much younger person and everybody else is, is much older. And I don't have any terrible stories of things that happen, but it's just not as fun. It's not as relaxing for your child. It's not that same feeling of being among your peers that you can have this social experience with. So, over and over again, I find that people are, are much more happy with finding a situation where it's other homeschool kids doing science with your child. Again, if you are that person who can go all out for uh, science during high school, you know, go, go, go. But it's the rare person. Most of us are going to find ourselves um, very happy to find someone else to teach, you know, chemistry, physics, advanced biology, all this all those end topics. So just just know that and don't despair if you're uh, looking at a homeschool curriculum thinking, wow. And again, uh, if you have picked a homeschool curriculum that's going very light on science um, through high school, uh, you, if that's what you wanna do, that's, that's fabulous. But 
just be kind of putting a check in your head thinking, hmm, you know, is this a full blown science, science program for my high school or just so that you know where you're at and what you've chosen. Renee. Thanks, Helen. Um, okay. You know, one thing I'd really like to touch on uh, and reemphasize that you said, um, when we started homeschooling back when our, you know, our children were in kindergarten and the programs we were looking at, the, um, the path that we were taking was not a very um, science intensive path. And even the programs we were looking at were very light on science. And I'd like to encourage any of you who are out there watching this, uh, watching this with us now, please do not make the mistake to go too light on your science curriculum. Um, you know, our job as homeschoolers is to prepare our children when they graduate to go into whatever field they choose. And in fourth grade, you, you can't lock them into a, a non-science career. Um, we don't know what they're going to decide later on. And you want them to have all of those building blocks. If they're going to go to medical school or into a science, they, you're going to put them at a disadvantage trying to catch up uh, when they're in 11th and 12th grade trying to catch up when they're doing their undergraduate work. And it can be overwhelming and, and some students uh, wanna take that science path and they can't because they just didn't have the building blocks. So I agree with everything Helen said um, to, to supplement that science, to make sure that they have a sound science background. Um, the, the program that we chose to use, we used uh, various different programs. The one that we stuck with, um, uh, the longest was Apologia Science, um, Exploring Creation. And this is a very bright and colorful program. The textbooks have uh, beautiful, bright graphics and pictures. It uh, has a daily schedule for you and it's all color coordinated. Um, the program relies uh, very heavily on activities and journaling, explaining what they've learned and what they've observed with their their experiments and their activities so there's a lot of notebook journalism there's lap books and little mini books and uh, it's also very heavy on vocabulary and science terminology so it does give a, a solid uh, groundwork for science as they move up into the high school uh, science uh, categories um, it also has uh, added on for um field trips, it gives suggestions for field trips and uh, worksheets to, to discuss and journal about their field trips. And just as Helen did, we did a lot of extra uh, fun science things on the side. Um, I'm not really huge on experiments and uh, doing those activities at home. So if we could go to the nature center or the science center or the science museum and see uh, experiments done and presentations and take classes. Um, all of my kids have taken science classes at co-op um, and, and those activities, whether it's your main science program or a supplemental, um, it really reinforces what you're, what you're doing at home when they can go in a group and, and do their dissections and um, do their experiments. Um, so I would really encourage all of you to make sure that you, you do a full science program. And, and if you have time and, and you want to, and you think your children are headed down that science path, supplement, supplement. Thanks, Renee. Renee and I, of course, have seen many students transition into science classes from their home science program. And many of them have had such joyful, fun, um, you know, hands-on experiences with science, very entertaining science um, career, and they are very positive about science. And there's so many good things about learning science in that unstructured way. But sometimes when, many times, when those children try to transition into sort of traditional science textbooks, it's a rough go. So if possible, try to find something, uh, you know, Critical Science Company has Science Detective, for example, that isn't, uh, it doesn't, maybe it doesn't take up a lot of time, maybe it's not a, an actual textbook with questions and answers, but it, it still offers enough of that experience that your child's spending a little bit of time uh, every year when they're young with this idea of reading and answering questions. Um, in a science format uh, just so that you can give them a 
you know, smoother start so that they don't hit that wall where uh, it's a shocker. And I myself love science units and did one after the other, but I'm just saying that if you're just going to do unit studies without a science text, and I guess that's why, I, you know, I, one of the things I liked about also doing Singapore science, but combining those two things a little bit in Renee and I's experience has a better outcome. All right, so the next thing Renee and I are going to talk about is literature and history. And many programs are going to separate these, but there's a number of homeschooling programs where these are really, really interlocking. The one thing goes with the other and they just connect. And so uh, I love sunlight. My older kids did sunlight almost all the way through. My younger kids stopped earlier because by then I was teaching uh, so many history classes at consortium that you know we just moved them into there. So here's the thing. I loved how the books for history so often were part of the books for literature. The way that these things moved together, I loved how the stories brought that time in history alive for my children. It was, it was a rich and wonderful experience for them. We added more books actually by going to the library and letting them pick out books that fit into the, the, the topic of their study. The big criticism I hear about sunlight from a lot of people is how hard it is to get through all the reading. So we did a couple things a little differently. We cut the Bible part out of sunlight. We didn't do it. I felt like my kids were getting enough of that at church and that I could add it in myself verbally a lot quicker than us reading through that whole part of it. Then the other thing we did is with the read alouds, and it's true, if you did all of those read alouds, it would, it would take a long time. But what we found worked well was, is, you know, as long as you have strong readers, is that we made a number of the read alouds into books they were going to read themselves. So just, in, you know, by buying more copies of the book, we could just add that to what they were going to read um, independently. We still did read alouds, but we cut down on the number. So by doing that, then I could add in more of what I wanted to add. So another thing that people um, sometimes complain about sunlight is that some of the books are too harsh, too dramatic, too full of woe. Uh, I did not find that with my older four children. I actually, even my, my oldest five children, I don't think I ever pulled a book. And there, there were, at, at that time at least, there were some, some very sad books, but I felt like that was teaching them about life. I thought that uh, it, the way it all went together really helped them understand um, you know, periods of time and the seriousness of different things. However, with some of my adopted children who I knew had triggers, who I knew were working through things on their own life, I did pull more books. And that's, a, that's one of the beauties of Sunlight is that the way it's set up, it's pretty easy to take out one book and substitute in another. And so if I knew something was coming, uh, I'm thinking of my dog, Jack, I think it was about them during the Civil War. I could then think ahead for those kids and, and pull it out. So I, I did not find that to be the problem that some people seem to think it is. I also really was happy with the way sunlight put a lot of emphasis on what's going on in the world today because I was always teaching uh, current events. And so um, I wanted a program that focused a lot on modern history and also could be tied into current events. I was very happy with how that all came together. I taught history at Consortium for many, many years. And so for my younger children, I think we probably kept doing sunlight through about ninth grade in addition to the classes I was teaching at Consortium, but then you know, we moved into more textbooks. Even for my oldest two children, uh, my oldest children, even though they went through, some of them all through the 12, the 12 years and some, I think through 10, I still bought some basic um, textbooks that people would use in a school. I really am pretty fond of Holt McDougall. So I wanted them to still have that experience of a textbook that was that still was pretty pro-American, but um, 
was going to give them that idea of the flow of history and a little more idea of what was being taught to people who went to school. So I just thought that that was a good way to end. You know, there's lots of people that don't. There's lots of people that stick to um, homeschool curriculums. I know it works out well. But anyway, that was how I decided to um, do it. The literature books um, from Sunlight, Again, I, I liked how those were all had sort of a theme to them and they pulled together, but you can, you know, it's very easy to add to your own. And if you watched our reading comprehension ones, you probably can guess that I also put all my children in different um, literature classes, whether they were ones that I was teaching or Renee was teaching or even, you know, in Michigan, other people to kind of sort of fill that circle of all the possible options. Um, Renee. Yeah, Helen, I really like the point um, that you made about having the history textbook. And also, um, my students, my kids did the same thing your kids did and took history classes at their local co-op. For us, that was consortium. And uh, Helen was their history teacher. So they took history with Helen for years in high school, really middle school up through high school. Um, in addition to the the uh, history curriculum that we were doing at home. And uh, if you have that available to you, if you have a local homeschool co-op or a group where you can do history together, it is so much fun. Um, I know this is about curriculum, but um, when you can make that curriculum, make that history come alive by studying it and then discussing it and having fun activities at, at uh, your homeschool group, it just brings that history uh, even more alive. Um, and Helen always did a fantastic job. Her history classes were filled to capacity, I'm pretty sure, every year because um, she's such a fantastic history teacher. Oh, Renee, you're so nice. I, I did want to put one thing in here at the end, and that's whatever history curriculum you pick. Over the years, I've found a couple things to be really true. And so one is, just like we buy into the idea, I think, that you, you know, a, a science program that had experiments would be a richer experience. I think that it's important with history and literature to think about what would be sort of the labs of that experience. And so I guess I've hit pretty hard on the idea of literature and having those book groups that are kind of like a lab, they're kind of the experience. But when kids were young, both Renee and I, through our homeschool programs, made a very big effort to have dress up days, to have field trips and field trips and more field trips, to have, you know, experiences like, you know, this is the first Thanksgiving, let's go to Plymouth and actually eat that, let's dress up like that. If we were, I, just the more you can go all out, the more your children are going to find these experiences come alive and are really, and um, become part of how everything comes together, how everything is, is connected. Uh, and a piece of that to think about when you're doing that is as much fun as it is, and we had such a great time. Uh, was it the Middle Ages? I, I think we had all the kids made their, um, made cardboard costumes, they got to make these uh, poles uh, to uh, spears, and oh, they had such a great time with that. So as fun as history can be, and as many of these hands-on experiences as you can put in that they'll, you know, they'll remember forever are, are beautiful, rich experiences. One thing if I could just get people to listen to is that a lot of homeschool programs just are very weak on current events, and so there's many, many, you know, young people all over the world who seem to be a little bit shaky on current events and politics, um, is if you can start building that into your curriculum so that your children understand the layers of things that are happening and can, can really be thinking about what's happening so that they understand. Because even if that happens later in high school or even if that happens, you know, in class, it's, it's different than kids that for years were building in the idea of how, how history and current events come together how one thing leads to the other, what is really being said in a particular situation. That's just my, my one piece of advice. And I know that it's hard to add in, but that is a piece that's hard to find with 
um, some homeschool curriculums. What do you think, Renee? Thanks, Helen. Um, uh, like Helen said, we, I took a similar approach with our history program. We used Veritas Press. Our family is a very history heavy sort of homeschool family. And uh, this, this program incorporates, um, it's very colorful in the younger years. It has memory cards. It, it uh, is, is very visually um, interesting. It, it brings in a lot of great art and it has the, uh, the, the literature component. And uh, that is so fantastic, particularly when you're starting out with young readers that they can read those historical fiction books and they can relate to those books in history as they're doing those history units. Um, it was a very comprehensive program that, that we used. They also, as Helen mentioned, they had a Bible program, which was the same, very similar setup as the history program that you could use. And, and we used that on and off, but the history was our main program. And uh, we also, as Helen said, would be running more history programs um, at once. We um, did this program and we would add additional programs. We would bring in more books and more texts because my kids just loved history. We loved reading about history. We loved history field trips. Um, so we could never get enough history books. If you were to look at our, uh, our homeschool library, we, we have a lot of science books, a lot of just straight literature books, but our big bulk is history books, historical fiction, history textbooks. Um, so, and I did like Veritas Press, as Helen said, you could pull a book and not do a book. You could add a book. It would offer some institutions if there was a book that maybe you had a problem with or you knew was not going to be um, appropriate for your child at, at, at that phase in their, um, in, their, uh, at, in their age, then you could do one of the alternate books that they recommended. Um, so overall, we, we were very happy with that program. Oh, thanks, Renee. And also just to sort of protect your child for the future, right? If you've explained to them, uh, you know, how things fit, if, or if you've helped them to understand how things fit together and how to think about things clearly, it, it just makes it easier for them to sort of decipher the world that they're going into too. So the next topic is writing. <clears throat> I don't, I, I feel like Renee is really the, the queen of writing instruction. And so I'm just going to hand it over to her. Uh, my children, my younger children all pretty much learned to write from Renee and Renee's, um, you know, amazing program that she did. So I'm going to um, hand it over to her because she's just sort of locally famous for teaching writing. Go ahead. Thanks, Helen. Um, the program that we use, that I use at home, and that we've used uh, in the co-op setting when I teach and when I tutor students in writing is the Institutes for Excellence in Writing, IEW. And this is a great program to teach your children uh, style and structure. It's heavy on vocabulary and grammar. And the way this program works is, um, a lot of the units are theme based, so you can pick different themes. Maybe you want to choose a history subject or a literature subject um, year to year. Um, and the program works, it has a workbook and the students work through the lesson. It'll have a grammar lesson. It will have a vocabulary each week. And each week they write some component of an essay. Um, it may be where they start out just writing one paragraph and then they build up to the five paragraph essay and then they build up uh, to super essays and to longer research reports. Um, so it does have a cumulative effect as they, they build on what they've learned and throughout the school year. It, it covers all of the different basic types of essays that your students should know how to write. Um, and it's a very good program. We've had a lot of success with it, at learning to write at home in our homeschool. And in, I've taught hundreds of students through this program um, from third grade all the way up through 12th grade in a co-op situation or a tutoring situation. Um, in addition to uh, the IEW, we also use Shirley English Grammar. It's important to have a, a strong grammar um, 
understand the fundamentals of strong grammar if you're going to write well. Um, you could have fantastic ideas that you want to communicate, but if your grammar is incorrect, um, it's really going to take away from your message. You do not want people looking uh, at your bad grammar or your punctuation mistakes. So you want to make sure that your children um, understand the mechanics of writing a sentence, of writing a paragraph. And we found that using both of those programs together um, gave a, a very comprehensive, was a very comprehensive English writing and grammar program. Thanks, Ellen. Oh, thanks, Renee. So Renee has taught, I, I bet a thousand students how to write well. She's uh, using that program. It, it seems that it's been just a runaway success. So I, I almost hate to, to mention another option since we've seen that work so well for homeschoolers over and over again. And in fact, once we moved here, soon after we moved here, my um, younger children started taking um, classes from Renee using that program that just, oh my goodness, it just knocked it out of the ballpark. And the way it was uh, set up incrementally just seemed to be, uh, you know, just made for homeschooling. So I sort of hesitate to bring up what I did with my older children, but I used the right source. So it's spelled W-R-I-T-E, right source. And uh, it's actually designed originally for uh, work in, the, in, in schools, but I loved it for my four older children. And so one of the things that's unique about it is that besides sort of a workbook for grammar, for usage, for putting sentences together, it has a sort of um, book for, it's colored beautifully um, organized for each kind of different thing that they might run into. So it's everything from commonly misspelled words to like the rules are, are just right in there for when to use a semicolon, when to use a colon, uh, when, you know, where, where do you put the uh, apostrophe, <clears throat> you know, when would you set something off with two commas? It's, it's, it's it's very beautifully set up for a child who's self-motivated. So that as my children were writing their long essays that you know we talked about in our reading comprehension, they could just grab that particular book that they each had in this hardcover book and go through and just double check themselves for a variety of things. But it also hit on you know specific kinds of um, problems with paragraphs, problems with sentences, so that uh, for the right kind of child. It was, it was very user friendly and it was extremely effective. It also came in handy that for the way that writing worked is that it was, it seemed like it kept getting sort of fresh because they, they worked for a while in persuasive writing and then you get a new folder for, uh, you know, compare and contrast and then you get a new folder for, um, you know, science writing, whatever. I, I liked how that was set up. I also liked it that it, from the time they're little all through 12th grade, there's these uh, spiral bound books where every day you do a grammar problem, a sort of, it's sort of like a time test, but you're looking at what's wrong and you, you correct it. And it's very easy to just show your kids what's the right one. You know, it's just a few minutes every day, both for grammar and usage. But it, it, work through that. So I was very happy with that program against the right source, W-R-I-T-E. However, I have recommended to some people who thought it was just too hard to work with, that um, there were too many components and that it was just asking for, for too much. So I think you could also think about just doing pieces of it if you didn't want to do the whole thing. Um, I liked it. My older children will thrive with that, but I don't know that my younger kids would have liked it as well as my older children. I felt like um, Renee's program worked very well for them. So I guess I'm a fan of both things. Uh, as far as grammar, that program has its own uh, sort of grammar component, but I'm, I've also uh, had um, with, I've also used something called Winston Grammar, where there's these cards, and so it's very hands-on, you know, when you're dissecting a sentence, you're laying out the card. And so we've also uh, used that for some grammar classes at Consortium very successfully. And additionally, uh, Montessori has some manipulatives that are 
I'm like, you know, my fingers work pretty well too for uh, making that part of the grammar hands-on. I, I would say if I had to pick between the two, I would pick uh, the Winston Grammar cards personally um, for that. So the last thing, Renee, and I wanted to just briefly talk about is um, thinking skills. So you might or you may or may not have thought about that as a topic, um, but it's something that Renee and I both wanted to actively teach our children, as many homeschoolers do. And I use the Critical Thinking Company. I, I use many, many of their books. So we did everything from, you know, mind benders. Uh, I think many, many of their books. And I also use them for a supplementary, which I'm sort of tying in there. For my younger children, I use their editor-in-chief program to supplement Renee's fabulous program. Uh, I, I feel like um, Critical Thinking Skills has a variety of different products that you could use for, uh, for basic level thinking skills. Um, I think that by the time your kids get older, you might be uh, looking for, for a different program. But for, for a lot of years, we really enjoyed their, um, their different workbooks, both for math, uh, reasoning, and uh, you know, taking different things as critical thinking components. Renee, you used a really great program for uh, thinking skills and logic, right? Well, we did, Helen. We used a lot of the same materials you did. Um, we uh, did... Uh, a lot of mind better benders. We ordered a lot of um, products from the Critical Thinking Company. We did Logic One and Logic Two, and uh, I really want to emphasize how important critical thinking is. Uh, it really ties into everything else you're doing in your homeschool. So you really want to add that component that's going to teach your children um, how to think and analyze and think through problems. It's a lot about problem solving. Um, so I, we really love all of the products that we got. I, I, I'm not sure we did quite as many as you did, Helen, but, um, but particularly mind benders was, uh, we did all of the mind benders um, as well as the logic. Well, you must have done a fabulous job because your older children definitely have very strong critical thinking skills. I, I also feel like this is a thing that's worth teaching and not just, um, you know, a one little unit that you do somewhere. But if you can work it into your curriculum for years um, in pieces or as a whole part, it's it's what we want to homeschool for, right? It's, it's the reason we do this, is we want to make sure that our children are thinkers. And I think that this can happen organically. You know, I've certainly known people who unschool that um, find ways to, to just work it into moments. And if you can do that, all the better. But just to have a curriculum that is doing that for you, I, I feel like just make sure that you've covered all of those bases. And in the world now where so much is happening, in the news and uh, there's so many different ways to interpret things that are going on. Having those thinking skills, I just feel like will prepare your children for whatever is coming. We, we always hear that our children will be having a number of different careers, that things are constantly changing, that 60% of our children will be doing jobs that don't even exist now in 25 years. And so what better sort of assurance can you give them than the ability to think clearly and well? That's how I looked at it anyway. So, <clears throat> Renee, did you have any closing thoughts on all of these curriculums? Thanks again, Helen. I, I really do. I think that, um, you know, we've just covered some of our favorites, um, some that have worked for us, that have worked for our different children. Um, and, you know, we've modified as we went along. If something wasn't working, if it didn't have enough substance to it, or it didn't have the right format, uh, we switched curriculums. It's really important that you research your curriculum, read the reviews, and read the reviews from real people um, so that, that you know what you're getting with the curriculum. It's, it's, it's an expensive investment sometimes, and uh, you want to get it right, and you want to make sure that you have prepared your child for whatever they're going to do, whether it's math, science, if they're going into humanities, languages, 
whatever they're going on to do, you want them to have a, a well-rounded background. So it's important that you pick a subject, you pick a curriculum that gives them a solid background in all of the subjects. Thanks, Renee. You said that so well. So friends, thanks for watching. Renee and I wanted to take the opportunity to just go over some curriculum options that we've used, that we found um, worked into our idea of homeschooling, where we wanted to have this sort of line running through our homeschooling where there was substance, where we were building into the future and our children would be able to launch well with all possible choices still open to them. And yet, have kind of combining that with unit studies, with field trips, with all the rich things that you do at home too. So that these all build together into a, a school experience, to homeschool experience, an educational experience that has been both joyful and rich, but also has those foundational pieces in it so that your child won't ever have a, a situation where it, it, it's hard to transition to the next piece. There's so many curriculum options out there and I know that it's hard to take the time to research out what's going to work best for you. But I really encourage you to do it because even though it's not, it wasn't, I don't think it was obvious to me when I first started homeschooling and I don't think it is to very many people how the curriculum you choose will influence your days, it will influence the, the joy of your days, will influence uh, how easy it is to put things together and pull things apart, how easy it is to, at the end of 12 years, feel like, yeah, all the boxes were checked versus, oh, I forgot this, I forgot that, this wasn't, this wasn't covered. So even though we don't have all the answers, we don't want to say we have all the answers, we did just want to put out enough information, enough thoughts along the way, and we hope it was, we, we hope you found some piece of it that would be really helpful to you too. Thank you for watching again. I hope to see you again on another one of our videos. Bye.